good morning or good evening or where, whatever it happens to be, wherever you are. And thank you very much for um, giving us a little bit of time from watching the US election, which seems to be distracting almost everybody around the place at the moment. So welcome to this keynote session of the symposium, Informal Formal Urbanism, the Challenges of Co-Production. My name is Kim Dovey and I'm Director of INFER, the Informal Urbanism Research Hub at the University of Melbourne. While we're from many parts of this uh, wonderful planet, I want to um, acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the particular place where this event is hosted uh, in Melbourne, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, uh, whose land here was invaded in the early 19th century and has never been ceded. It's a great pleasure today to introduce Gautam Ban, who has joined us from Delhi to speak with us. Uh, Gautam teaches and researches on the politics of urban, urban poverty and inequality at the Indian Institute for Human Settlements in Delhi, where he tells us he has just had to uh, break into his office. <laughs> There's all kinds of protocols about getting into universities these days. Um, he holds a PhD in city planning from UC Berkeley, uh, the same university where I was at some years before. His research has focused on the displacement and resettlement of the urban poor in Delhi. He's an active public intellectual in urban social movements in India and is author of the book In the Public's Interest, Evictions, Citizenship and Inequality in Contemporary Delhi, and in also the earlier book, Swept Off the Map, Surviving Eviction and Resettlement in Delhi. He's an editor of the Routledge Companion to Planning in the Global South and Because I Have a Voice, Queer Politics in India. His talk today is entitled Informality and the Lockdown, thinking from Indian cities. So Gautam will speak for about 35 minutes and then we will open the floor to questions. So please um, share your questions whenever you like through the Q&A function on your screen and then eventually I'll read them out uh, and we can discuss them. Thank you, over to you Gautam. Um, thank you Lord, very much uh, uh, Kim and others. The, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, and uh, as Kim was saying, our COVID protocols require us to get oxygen saturation, temperatures checked at the door, and so I, I was running a little bit late, but it seems a bit fitting for the time. Um, I am going to uh, talk us through a little bit in thinking about informality, uh, conceptually thinking from the lockdowns, particularly from Indian cities. And I'm doing so using a specific example to enter into that theoretical conversation, um, which is to think about relief and social protection quite closely. So the question, a lot of the work that I was doing during the lockdown was to actually work as part of government efforts on emergency hunger relief in Delhi. And I think one of the things that the lockdowns offer us as a provocation theoretically and as urbanists is to also ask what this period of relief has told us about the practice of social protection in urban areas and what that does to take back to our questions of the conceptions of informality that we many of us have been working with for many years. So I'm going to read today from a text as a new experiment for me, but I thought I'd try it. Um, so I'll just go run through. The dominant image of COVID-19 pandemic in India is of thousands of people leaving cities for rural districts despite lockdowns forced to walk hundreds of kilometers around highways such as that in the picture as interstate transport was shut down. They were driven out of urban areas by a host of factors, uncertainty of the length of the lockdowns, sudden loss of income and employment, the inability to bear the costs of urban life, and particularly rent, and I'll come back to this, concern for their families, or even the possibilities of using certain social protection benefits available only outside cities, such as guaranteed public work employment through India's National Rural Employment Guarantee Program. Cities that were meant to hold the promise of social and economic mobility seem, in this moment, to have failed. We must, however, step further back. The story of the pandemic and its attendant lockdowns in India is not one of a singular crisis. It is instead, I would argue, a continuation of an everyday vulnerability that far preceded this moment. Two snapshots paint a picture of this vulnerability. The first is Delhi, my hometown, a city of 17 million people. 
When the first lockdown started, <clears throat> the government announced an emergency food relief program. We're talking about basic dry rations here. Rice, wheat, lentils, oil, and sugar. 7.2 million of Delhi's residents are already covered under India's National Food Security Act, which means they get monthly supplies of these through fair price distribution shops all over the city. The government anticipated a further vulnerability and it announced an additional allocation of 1 million. Okay. So city of 17 million, 7.2 people are covered. The government announces a relief measure of an additional 1 million. Within eight days of this relief program being announced, 3.8 million people apply. So almost four times the anticipated vulnerability for food within six weeks of the first lockdown. The second is from ongoing work that IHS is engaged with, with a union of domestic workers in the North Indian city of Jaipur. When the lockdown started, the union conducted a rapid survey of its own members. 500 workers were called, and the findings were unsurprisingly severe, but two stand out. Even before COVID, most households had savings to cover only 20 days of household expenses without new income. The surveys asked domestic workers most what they thought about the day the lockdowns were announced. Food came first, job security and income second, and health was a distant third. Responses to the pandemic did not anticipate how this vulnerability would both shape the impact of the virus or people's ability to cope with it. Calls to stay at home and work from home, rooted in the imaginations of a northern urbanism where either of these are possible, misrecognized India's urban conditions. Eight out of 10 workers in India have jobs in the informal economy. Most of them work in public space, as street vendors, waste pickers, and construction workers or they work in other people's homes as domestic workers. This is a not work that can be done at home. For most of them, COVID was a crisis of health and livelihood. It was less an epidemiological problem than one of a far broader urban vulnerability. When migrants started walking hundreds of kilometers, defying lockdown orders, they were not unaware of the risk that they were taking. They were, in fact, doing exactly what health professionals wanted them to do they were avoiding death. For them, death could occur not just from COVID, but equally from shocks to their livelihood without the safety nets of social protection systems. This pandemic feels global. It is something happening everywhere, monumental in its scale and universal in its impact. Yet the way it is experienced in different places is particular, different for New Delhi than for New York. For some time now, Southern urban theorists have been insisting on the need to think from particular places, to listen to particular questions that certain places compel us to consider. One way to think from Indian cities at this moment is to precisely listen to the vulnerability that preceded this crisis. It is to ask questions about the efficacy of urban social protection regimes within a political economy dominated by informal employment, where, in the words of Edgar Peterson and Abdul Malik Simon, as they described the South, it is the majority that holds social, spatial, and economic vulnerability. The pandemic has showed us that the safety net in India cities is a patchwork, its threads worn and in need of repair. As urban Indians, we knew this, even if we had collectively learned ways to look away from the everyday inequality that surrounds us. In this moment, at least, that evasion seems impossible. Yet when we look straight at the problem, it is not immediately clear what repairing this patchwork looks like. How does one strengthen what is a patchwork? Do you incrementally fill in or do you expand its borders first? Do you layer differently at each end or do you try and standardize and create a new fabric foundation? Social protection systems were designed in the context of industrial work, meaning that workers, workplaces and employers all took specific roles. Claims were based on the person's identification as a worker, the employer became the delivery agent and the workplace rooted the transactions in space. How does one reframe this relationship without the employment contract implicit in this imagination? How do we do so when the work itself is hidden under categories of unrecognized and informal employment or when the workplace is unrecognized 
such as in the case of a public street. Disconnected from the particular nature of India's urban employment, many state efforts to suddenly respond to the needs of workers failed. When the pandemic began, for example, every level of the Indian state issued directives to not retrench workers or to not hold back wages. These were, for the most part, utterly ineffective, utterances rather than mandates. The nature of informal employment meant that it was unclear who they were directed to or how they could possibly be enforced. Return to the domestic workers that I talked to you about at the beginning of this talk. In the survey, they saw their wages fall by 93% between February and April. 25% had already lost work in the first six weeks of the lockdown, and a further 28% did not even know if they had been retrenched or continued to be employed. They were simply uncertain. The disconnect between policy mechanisms and the realities of urban lives extended beyond the conditions of work. Most workers in southern cities also live in forms of informal housing that mirror the precarity of their work status. Many that left cities at the start of the pandemic lived in homes that offered so little security that they could be left overnight, even after years of residence in urban life with a single bag of possessions in hand. For those that stayed, their housing conditions exacerbated rather than alleviated their vulnerability. Same domestic workers reported that they were exiting the first lockdown with 10,000 Indian rupees or a month of their income in debt and three fourths of that debt was rent. Similar to state directives on wages, there was a moratorium on rent payments and similar to the directive on wages within an informal urbanism, there were no mechanisms of enforcement with informal rental arrangements and landlords that remained opaque to state systems. When social protection programs have taken food, income, and health more seriously, rarely have they reached out to include housing. Yet spatial and economic vulnerability are deeply intertwined at every scale, and nowhere more so than in self-built cities where property is incrementally constructed and consolidated over time. When migrants left urban centers, it showed how vulnerability and absent social protection determines where workers settle as much as the more familiar logics of wage and income. Particular configurations of vulnerability, including their economic, social, and spatial dimensions must shape the determination of entitlements as well as the mechanisms of delivery of social protection. When faced with the COVID crisis, the Indian state responded to the challenge of delivery in a number of ways. And I think it's pivotal that we focus as much attention on the delivery of mechanisms as to the announcements and contestations about rights and entitlements. So the state first turned to existing methods that it already knew. The most effective by far in India was food. A system of entitlements was already in place due to India's National Food Security Act, which I alluded to earlier. Households held food cards, they call them ration cards in colloquial Indian English, that entitled them to subsidize grain and sugar through an already existing spatial and institutional structure of food distribution shops. Both federal and state programs added quantities of rice, wheat, and other essentials to pre-existing rations. They added five more kilos of rice. They doubled the quantity of grain as relief measures. The contours of the system were in place. The pandemic was testing only if the system could suddenly increase the quantum of an entitlement and deliver twice the food through the same system. Its expansion was essential, but its form is imaginable. Yet the second set of challenges to reimagine social protection is more difficult. How does one build a set of entitlements based on work, the hist as the history of social protection has done, but do so within the informal economy? Over the past decade, this is where innovations have come, led mostly by worker cooperatives, federations, and movements. In India, there are two very strong examples I want to point out. The first is specific protections for construction workers under the Building and Construction Workers Act of 1996. And the second, more recent, a significant legal victory and the passage of the Street Vendors Protection of Livelihood Act 2014. Here, <clears throat> specific recognition of forms of actually existing work 
become the basis of demanding not just entitlements and social protection, but also rights to decent work, wage, and job security. Yet the pandemic showed us the difficulty of fulfilling the promises of even these acts where the entitlement for informal workers have been won without having equivalent procedures of delivery that work for informal workers. Let's take construction. In order to get the cash transfer that the government promised construction workers as COVID relief, they had to be registered with the state. Nationally, no more than half of all construction workers are registered, and even few of those registrations are current. In Delhi, only 10% of the city's estimated half a million construction workers, and this estimate was up to a full million, received the promised cash transfers. The lack of registration is not a simple implementation gap. Worker unions have long argued that low enrollment is a result of procedural mechanisms of registration that are not designed either to trust workers or to fit into their lives. Social protection for formal employment is not divided by sectors of employment. It's set within labor codes. And rights and entitlements are often standardized no matter where one works. Should new systems for informal employment also consolidate in this manner? This is a tricky debate that COVID has given us and risen once more to the forefront. While many implications of informal work are shared, the absence of meaningful recognition, the reliance on public rather than firm or enterprise-based infrastructure, Conditions specific to different types of work impact how these precautions and protections can be delivered. Minimum wages, for example, for street vendors cannot be delivered the same way as for domestic workers. The former are own account workers without a specific employer or the notion of a wage. The latter are waged employees in private homes where again, the conceptual category of employer doesn't readily translate into categories of practice and identification. So expanding the scheme, the social safety net, is not just a question of increasing registration and multiplying schemes for innumerable categories of workers by sectors of the informal economy. It requires us to think through a more universal set of claims and entitlements, as well as retaining specificity when it comes to the modes of delivery. And one of the big provocations I want to leave us with today is that I believe as urbanists, we have under-theorized informality in the context of institutional function and delivery of entitlements as we have used it as a diagnostic and analytical category to talk about the inadequacies of entitlements. One archive that is essential then to look at new possibilities is to look at relief itself, what happened in these last six months. To respond to the Indian state uh, the pandemic, the Indian state had to innovate. Would the innovations that they have to do in the name of relief offer more than just an exposure that I've been talking about of the patchwork of the current safety net? Would these relief practices also offer us ways to expand, strengthen, and repair social protection as we know it today? So when the Indian state started doing relief work, it realized quite quickly that all its existing databases and schemes would only reach a fraction of those who needed relief. Government officials therefore scrambled to expand their reach. Some states began to use one database to integrate and layer entitlements, giving food to all those holding construction worker registrations, for example, or giving cash to everyone who held food cards. State also sought to expand database enrollment to new multiple drives, new surveys, apps, helplines, online applications, greatly expanding the means to which citizens could ask for help. They renewed expired registrations and fast-tracked pending applications. All of these methods hold critical lessons for what could be done by a state seeking equal urgency to universalize social protection and not just respond to a crisis. Indeed, relief, in a sense, offers a map of what everyday social protection must look like in a post-COVID world. One innovation is particularly noteworthy for our analysis. As governments sought to expand the categories of who could avail relief, a new language of bureaucratic and governmental practice emerged. From a range of government orders, researchers at IHS have been looking at how did the government identify who was to be given relief. We now find 
from the older categories, food cart holders, pension, rural job cart holders, from some new innovative work categories, the street vendors and construction workers, but register that I talked to you about, a plethora of new language. We find those stranded or distressed, daily wages, migrant, casual or construction site workers and hawkers, contractual, casual, daily wage, outsourced staff, and even marginal sections of society who have been deprived of their daily wages during the lockdown period. For many of these new categories of claims and claimants that the state was willing to recognize in relief, the procedures emphasize self-declaration rather than means testing without a demand of the evidentiary proof of vulnerability. There was a greater concern for genuine exclusion rather than false inclusion, a move away from the emphasis, for example, on registration. These new categories of work, need, and workers, as well as the expanded and temporary databases that Relief has created, represent a valuable political opportunity. Many of them are precisely the overlap of spatial and sectoral identities, of work and place-based identities, of subjectivities that straddle and seek to integrate social and work status with spatial location. The language of these new categories, in other words, is one that emerges from the specificities of our urban conditions, offering new routes of possible reimagination. So I want to suggest four, in closing, four provocations that then abstract from this empirical archive I've been giving you about what happened to social protection and relief for informal workers during the pandemic. The first I want to say is, and a lot of my own work, I've thought about informality conceptually as something that grapples with the tensions between a need for opacity, a certain distance from the view of the state in particular, but also the need for a certain kind of legibility, a certain kind of visibility. In the context of the informal settlement, we would describe this tension as this. When auto-constructing property in a southern Indian city, if the state looks at you too closely, there is too much legibility, you risk eviction, you risk censure, you risk the tension that you have within formal logics of law, property, and planning turning into violence against you. But if the state does not look at you at all, you risk any loss of public investment, even the incremental growth of services. In my own work, I have long defended the relationship of informality conceptually with some degree of opacity, some distance from legibility that threatens to become state co-option and surveillance. The pandemic for me personally has really challenged uh, for me, the conceptual vocabulary of thinking about informality in this dialectic between opacity and legibility. I think, and learning from, say, federations like WeGo, Women's, um, uh, Women in Informal Employment Globalizing and Organizing, which is one of the largest federations of women informal workers globally, the question for me seems to be shifting to the terms of recognition as opposed to whether or not the informal even has the capacity or possibility to play the opacity, opacity versus legibility game anymore. This has come from many places. It's not just coming from the pandemic. Um, in looking at informal housing in Delhi, for example, we've seen in the last 10 years the use of extensive GIS technology, which means that the state has more maps of informal built environment than it ever did in a previous time period which meant, again, the tensions of opacity and legibility are unfought. But again, speaking very personally, and I think it's very important for us to not, to, to, to think about the fact that we faced the pandemic, not just as academics, but also as activists, organizers, and citizens, I saw and experienced what that opacity that also gives informality its flexibility did in a moment of crisis to exacerbate vulnerability. Working in, in the delivery mechanisms of trying to get emergency food relief, the question of saying, but how do you find informal workers? How do you know how to give them this entitlement? Where do you deliver this relief? It turned for me, I think in some senses, a real sharp distinction between informality as a diagnostic category and its insufficiencies when one thinks about it as a 
conceptual framework for the delivery and institutionalization of something like social protection. The second thing that I think has struck me very much conceptually is that I think that we have not done nearly as much work to pull together the spatial and economic aspects of informality. They work differently, but in connected ways. And we all know this, but I don't think that our bodies of theory allow us enough sophistication in wielding them together into political practice. So the question of should social protection go place-based and organize around neighborhoods of concentrated vulnerability or go via work-based identities when actually those workers live precisely in those places. For we don't have frameworks that allow us to work well with how economic and spatial informality actually co-produce each other. I've been doing a lot more work with WeGo over the last 10 years. And one of the things that's been really interesting is how they are trying to spatialize a lot of their work on informal employment and try and think about what spatial informality does and does not do to economic informality. The third for me is what I've been saying, I think, and I'll just mark it here because I've made the point um, a couple of times, is that informality confounds delivery. And so therefore, when one thinks in the questions of social protection, when one searches for ways in which to understand, given these conditions of, inform of informal work, what are the new modes of practice that can actually deliver trusting workers, like we said earlier? When, I, when we went hunting for ideas on how to do this in relief, I realized that we again had created a body of work around informality that I think privileged it as a diagnostic category and not as a category of practice. And I think because informality in so many places in our theory is always in tension with the state, in theorizing how a state can practice amidst informality, there isn't, I think, as much scholarship as there needs to be. And the last point that I wanted to make about, um, about informality itself here was that it, I was reminded yet again about how the geographies of vulnerability and informality have to be more carefully taken apart. In my own city that I've been studying for so many years, the, the, the demand for emergency food did not come predominantly from informal settlements which meant that our feeling that for many years that informal built environments are not adequate spatial proxies for urban poverty is actually quite right, at least in Delhi's case. The demand was geographically much more diffused. And I think that it reminded me um, in many ways of the need to constantly ask about the geography of the current distribution of both spatial and economic informality and in some ways realize that categories of informal settlements of the slum, quote unquote, um, often settle into an easy empirical proxy equivalence on, on poverty and vulnerability, which I think is, make, is, at least for the empirics of Indian cities, has really made me think um, in some ways for the need for new empirical investigation on these properties. In conclusion, I want to just think about where we go from here. So writing about Hurricane Katrina, the geographer Neil Smith once said that there is no such thing as a natural disaster. Crises, he argued, only reveal pre-existing fault lines of inequality along which new risks run, deepening and sedimenting them. COVID and its attendant lockdowns have made the inequities of India's urbanization evident. They have not caused them. Insisting on this shift in diagnosis, is must be where we all begin. This essay has spoken of the relief, but its assessments it will equally apply to recovery and moving forward to any possibility of resilience. Thinking from Indian cities insists that we ask anew questions that specify and detail the empirical configurations of vulnerability in our own cities, wherever they are. It insists on rooting these vulnerabilities in specific urban conditions, asking how urbanism has shaped them and is shaped by them in turn. It insists that we imagine frameworks of social protection that take rent as central to a dignified human life as wage, that acknowledge informal employment as meaningful and valued work, 
that invest in expanding public institutions like the food distribution system, and that find new ways to deliver entitlements that fit into the life worlds of a majority of urban residents. This is above all, and I think that I have to say this is the dominant sense that I leave this year with, a moment of warning. No amount of social protection can alleviate the fallout of an urbanism that has entrenched social, economic, and spatial inequality. India's growth story has been a global narrative for nearly two decades. A lot indeed has changed here in that time. Yet the foundations of this growth has, as this past year has shown us, been a patchwork. If paradigms of urban development do not recognize the vulnerabilities of their foundations, if we find new ways of forgetting and evasion once again, there will be remain little to separate the crisis from the everyday. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, very much, uh, Gautam. And now we have some time for <clears throat> uh, questions and discussion. There's certainly a lot to, um, to, to, to bite on there. Let me see what we've got in the way of a couple of questions. I'm simply going to read these out pretty much in the order mm -hmm. in which they come. So as we go through this, could you please um, uh, add any questions to the Q&A that, that have uh, come to mind during this period? Okay, uh, we have one from Lutfan Naha Lata saying, thanks for the wonderful presentation. My question is related to the geographical informality and food distribution. I would like to know whether volunteers in Indian cities distributed food and relief through local informal community members, and also what kinds of social protection are available for informal workers during COVID-19? And thanks. So, so they were, you know, so the so one of the things we've been doing here as a group um, is to look both at what the state did and what non-state civil society actors did. Both mobilized in huge numbers in India. Um, I think so. On the state side, let me give you the example of the, the city I know best, which is Delhi. So I won't speak for all of India, but for Delhi. So in Delhi, the dominant response was from the state. As I said, you saw that. So 7 million people already covered and an additional 3.8 million were covered, which meant that in Delhi, 1,500 public schools were turned into what were called hunger relief centers. And in these hunger relief centers, cooked food was given twice a day um, to 800,000 people per meal. And dry rations were given once a month to the 3.8 million people that applied. So the state system in Delhi was the dominant response system. And I think this is very interesting for me to think about. It, it worked alongside vast civil society mobilizations, um, including emergency ration supply, including helplines, including uh, networks of organized community demand uh, that circulated through donor networks in those places. So both the systems ran in parallel, a strong state response that used the formal public institutional system and the non-state response that used more spatial community-based networks. And I think it's really interesting to think that, to think of why state and non-state actors mobilized in different ways. So non-state actors tended to use spatial identification strategies, which meant that they went to neighborhoods they knew as activists and organizers and they said they made lists of people who needed help in those neighborhoods. The state did not go spatial by place. It went structural and said anyone apply and then delivered through a distributed but spatially distinct school system infrastructure. So I think what's really interesting is to think about who mobilized what kinds of strategies. So what was common to both of them is that the challenge of how to find those and allow them ways to reach you were common. So both types of actors use extensive helplines. They were, they were everywhere. Lots of WhatsApp became one of the most dominant ways to organize citizen relief particularly. But what was, in, what was incredibly important was the existence of networks of community organizers across vulnerable neighborhoods who knew each other from before the crisis. In Delhi, these networks became the spine of the civil society response to food distribution in particular. And they were able to mobilize 
lists of hundreds of households per settlement um, on a daily basis and organize relief and move on. They had to remember, work very closely together because the lockdown was on in this period. So you could only move around the city if you had a government pass certifying that you were doing citizen volunteer work. So there was also very interesting moments of collaboration and participation. In fact, a lot of civil society actors chose neighborhoods where government relief was light and re-emphasized those. So there was a way to try and spatially align and not double dip in many ways. So I think that the food relief in Indian cities showed us multiple modalities of moving. And I think we have to mine a little bit um, about the state's strategies and civil society strategies and see what they tell us. For informal workers and social protection, we have a very interesting schism in India, which is that much of our social protection system is rurally in nature. So we have, an, we have one of the world's largest public employment programs, but it is the National Rural Employment Guarantee. Guarantees 100 days of inflation indexed wage work for every adult member of every rural household. Right? So one of the things, one of the really important discussions that has started now post COVID is why is there not an urban equivalent of the rural guarantee program? The National Rural Health Mission started 10 years before the National Urban Health Mission, which is yet to begin. So in many ways, there is a peculiar history to India's own both post-colonial and urbanization trajectories. Remember, South Asia remains one of the least urban regions in the planet. India is still statistically, officially only 35% urban. Um, but even if you overcome statistical manipulations, no one thinks we're more than 50% urban. But we're also a country that has struggled to accept urbanization as a developmental trajectory. Right? This was a country that was meant to live in its villages. And our developmental imagine is certainly still rural. So the question of how to create a social safety net for the urban is actually an emergent question for us. It has not gone the other way. In fact, many of the, uh, the, the national food security programs, for example, were started in rural areas and simply copy pasted to the urban. So it's actually the reverse of what one would think. The advent of these new schemes, like the Construction Workers Act, um, like the Street Vendors Act, this is, I think, where the new innovations are happening in practice, where specific categories of informal workers are basically saying, we're not covered under standard labor codes, we're not covered under the Factories Act, we're not covered under the Industries Act. Where are we recognized as workers? And this is the point I want to, move, to suggest that we all really put our minds to more, which is to ask the question of saying, if these informal workers are now increasingly being recognized as claimants to social protection as workers, what are the terms of this recognition? Right? What kinds of regulation is going to follow this recognition? How should the state think of construction work? Right? How should it allow its opacity as well as its legibility, its flexibility as well as this regulation? So what's interesting about new urban social protection, the strongest entitlement is food. Um, the missing entitlement is employment. And the new recognition in terms of work is actually to think about whether that recognition should come sectorally. Because right now what's happening is every sector of the informal economy is creating social protection differently. Thank you. There's a brief follow-up from Lutfan saying it's the same in Bangladesh. It's very rural-focused uh, programs, um, mm -hmm. a gap in the urban. Um, the next question is from Manas Murthy, <coughs> University of Oregon, saying, thank you for your contribution to the conceptual framework on informality. In keeping with your dialectic framework, how does one grapple with the dialectics of dependency and autonomy? when considering the predicament of the informal worker, at once a, uh, quote, disenfranchised mass, unquote, and an army of individual, quote, entrepreneurial genius, unquote. So this is especially considering relief and delivery as dependent on the state. That's from Manas Murthy. It's a very good question. You know, it's, um... There is a, you, there's a, so much of, and I, luckily the new, new scholarship does it less, but so much of the scholarship on informality has oscillated between either the romanticization of agency and a severe underestimation of vulnerability or a complete overestimation of, um, uh, or, you know, or its opposite. And 
The truth is, of course, that the world, life worlds of spatial and economic informality are both celebrations of agency and marked by deep structural vulnerabilities. Um, and I think that one of the tensions in thinking about how to balance these is partly for me, the way I resolve it is thinking about where to look. I think that the question is much more complicated if you talk about, for example, access to wage, income, and wealth for workers um, than it is then talking about social protection. Because I think social protection for me is a, is a system of entitlements that derive from work as rights, but are something that I do not read at all through the conceptual lens of dependency. And I think here, it's very important to think about why the, the notion of dependency attaches itself to state social security. There's a long history of these debates. In the American context, they've been fought, um, I think, in the most pressing way. So, um, you know, there is a wonderful piece on the genealogy of when in the US debates about welfare suddenly became debates about dependency as opposed to debates about empowerment. And the distinction that was made in the American conceptual tradition was about the distinction between what was seen as social security as a just reward for labor and social insurance or assistance, which was seen as charity or a handout. And over time, that distinction took all of welfare into the realm of charity and handout with the emergence, for example, of Bill Clinton's notions of workfare and the idea of the welfare queen. I think it's pivotally important that we, we fight this idea of thinking about social protection from the lens of dependency. I think it's a very dangerous um, um, uh, argument because it changes the notion of social protection as an entitlement that is a recognition of already performed labor, as opposed to a notion that makes you dependent on the state. And I think social protection more than other schemes allows you that because it can be in its conception, both preventive or protective, a minimum floor but it is also entirely promotive and transformative, which is about thriving and flourishing. So I think that to me, when we think a little bit about social protection, it both centrally places the state because I don't, I don't think that any systems of safety nets at scale can work without state function. Um, this is one of the reflections I had from my own work during the lockdown where the scales of food distribution that the government of Delhi did would not have been possible by any other formal informal network civil society structure. There is something about the scale of that response there that I think is required. So I would say, can we find conceptual vocabularies that talk about the support informal workers need, um, but does not do it or allow it to be framed politically in the discourse of dependency um, but uses the language of the recognition of labor. So it draws on histories of labor organizing and social protection instead. Um, and I think, that, I think that in many places globally, some of that move has happened. And I think the organization and federation of workers have really put new conceptual language into practice that allows to get away from this, that, this structure. Um, I... I, at this moment, and I'm saying at this moment, because I, I always want to recognize how overdetermined the moment of the lockdown is. And, and I think it's, I'm happy to look at it straight in the face, but I'm also aware that a lot of my thinking right now is as much an emotional response to what we've been struggling with this year as anything else. I, I find myself really leaning to say that if I were to make an error on leaning towards one side of the lockdown, I would do it towards um, creating greater structures of delivery um, and letting go a bit right now of the question of entrepreneurship and freedom and empowerment. You know, I think crises make you remember that freedom cannot become abandonment. Um, and I think the distinction, particularly in, in liberal political thought, um, between um, not recognizing how easily freedom can equate to abandonment is something that other concepts of, of a more horizontal solidarity and fraternity, if you take sort of an Ambedkarite philosophical tradition, say from the Indian academic, um, uh, academic thought. Um, I think that those are the spaces that I would like to be in. And I think if you think in terms of creating relationships of solidarity um, and circularity and fraternity, 
It allows you to escape both um, dependence, but also this notion of, of freedom that is indistinguishable from abandonment. Okay. Thanks, Gautam. Um, uh, another question. Is this report documenting varying modalities of COVID relief work in Indian cities? Is it available online? Uh, it, it, it will be very soon, as I remember my own deadlines for it. So what is on, online already? So um, IHS has a, a knowledge gateway on our main website, which is ihs.co.in. So the survey of domestic workers that I referred to is published and available, and you can just pick up our social media handles. The first report that looks at 181 orders across 17 states in India for food, cash transfer, and labor entitlements. Um, will probably be out in early December. And the second report looking at um, non-state civil society and citizen relief efforts um, in four states will be out in mid-December. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from Jitta Manu, who asks, coming from a legal background and having been reading your work, um, we don't see an urban movement coming from a constitutional perspective given the constitutional design have restrict lots, restricted lots of efforts in our current crisis. How to address this discord between law and other social sciences fields? Yeah. You're, I, mean, I, would, I would say you're right in some ways about the law. Uh, in, I'm trying to think of your assertion about whether the constitutional frame has not offered a lot to urban mobilization. It has and it hasn't. And I think it's, if, I, um, if I think in some ways, certainly in housing, there is a very significant uh, lacunae. Right? Um, I mean, in a lot of my work I've written about, uh, the encounter that most informality within housing has with the law is usually one of um, disadvantage and violence, uh, particularly run through the eviction. I think that one of the things that, again, we struggle with in many ways is to not imagine the urban as a site of a particular form of social and spatial settlement. Right? I think one of the things is, so India also urbanized in a particular way. Right? So what it was only about 10 years ago, uh, actually, let me say this way. 10 years ago, about 2005, for the first time, more of India's GDP came from urban areas than rural areas. And it came at a time of economic restructuring where most of that urban contribution came from non-employment rich sectors like finance, real estate, and IT. So we have a very strange structural economic gap where our political system, and therefore our legislators and lawmakers, are elected from places that do not contribute to the kind of economic capital growth that they want. Right? Because out of 540 odd seats in India's parliament, only 110 are urban. So you see this disjunct between the formal structure of our representative democracy, where you don't get elected from the urban. So every political party in India says that they don't want to close an identification with the urban because it's electoral suicide. And so you're getting elected from the rural, which is where your large number of employment demand is, but your GDP, 65% of it, is coming from a set of 25 cities. So the urban in much of our imagination is actually very much a place that extracts the capital that turns into welfare rurally. And this is a disjunct in some sense between the geography of where welfare happens but where accumulation happens. And in this framework, the the motivations of lawmakers to create enabling constitutionally inspired legislation to think about the urban not just as a source of 62% of the GDP is very thin on the ground. The other big thing, as you will know from someone with your background, is that India does not have powerful urban administration. We don't have that third sphere of power, right? Our cities are governed by our states. So in our federal system, a city like Mumbai is governed by the state of Maharashtra. So we do not have municipalities, mayors, elected government officials that are embedded in city regions. This is a 
particular outcome of the structure of our constitutional government framework. And if you study the history of the Indian constitution, one of the big debates between Ambedkar, Gandhi, and Nehru was precisely on the question of the structures of rural government. So the 73rd Amendment to the Indian Constitution decentralized funds, functions, and functionaries to village councils, which we call panchayats, far more effectively than the 74th Amendment, which was meant to decentralize urban governance to the municipality and to the ward level. The 73rd Amendment was reasonably successful with wards and all. The 74th Amendment did not even start. So one of the big tensions in thinking about pol the politics within urban areas is that we do not have a proximately, proximate layer or scale of urban government that is powerful. Right? So the municipal, which is such a strong conceptual and practice-based notion of urban governance in the North Atlantic, the municipal in India is not the dominant space of urban governance, which means that you have a you don't have the enabling conditions of politics that allow us constitutional interpretations and readings because our democratic structures of government are not accountable immediately to urban re residents the way they are, the way the state thinks about the rural. So there's two answers to your question. There is a political economy answer of the question of the disjunct between where, wealth, where the money for the rural welfare comes from. And there is the history of the missing local government, empowered local government, um, story from our constitutional notion of urban governance, which I think makes a huge difference. Um, one of the things that I, reasons I think Delhi is able to do certain things because it's the closest thing we have to empowered city government. Because even though the government of Delhi is technically a state government in our federal system, because it's a national capital territory, it actually acts like a little bit like a city government. And I think that distinction is really quite important. Okay, thank you. Um, it, it appears that I'm going to get a chance to answer to ask you a question of my own, uh, Gautam. Um, I was taken by uh, well a lot of aspects of your discussion, um, particularly this 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 question of um, the visibility of opacity of uh, legibility and recognition, which seems to me to be one of the key connections. Uh, the what the ways in which these issues um, play into urban space, and indeed your call to connect the spatiality and the economics uh, of, of these dimensions and for more empirical re research. I was thinking about some of the, the work that I've been doing with Red and Reccio on looking at informal trading and the ways in which informal traders are, uh, are, are face this kind of dilemma that they need visibility because the highly visible streetscapes are the ones where the money is. That's, that's where the economic opportunity is. And yet it's also where the danger of uh, street clearances and so on comes. But, but I'm actually wondering whether you could say any more about how you see the kind of call for more research, because I, I agree with you that there's, there's an awful lot that we don't know about this, this intersection of the economic and the social with the spatial uh, with regard to urban informality. Can you just comment a bit more about some of that? So we've been trying to do this in different ways. So one of, one of the things that struck me, I'll, I'll, I'll run it through an example. So when we started working, you know, the, the union that we work with, um, we knew as you know, fellow organizers and activists before we became research partners more formally. So we have a kind of, we have a very sort of happy co-production type of relationship automatically because we knew each other as comrades as opposed to institutional work. And one of the things the head of the union said to me at one point that I thought was really powerful, she said that in the monthly worker meetings, she was noticing a consistent pattern that there seemed to be a disproportionate amount of attention that the workers paid to rent. She said, I get it, rent is difficult, but, and so it's interesting, right? So here's a union that really comes from a history of organizing around conditions of work, relationships with the employer, the presence of contract, the enforcement of rights, and the regulation of wage, like that's bread and butter, right? And she says, but we keep talking about rent all the time, right? And I don't know how to think about the housing of the domestic worker as a, you know, in terms of my sensibilities as a union organizer. And we started then, we said, okay, let's do, let's do a quick piece of work on this. And what was very interesting for us is to realize that the reason why rent was a, such a disproportionate um, burden on domestic workers versus, for example, waste pickers, street vendors in Jaipur, right, compared to other informal workers, was that domestic workers 
the new pattern of domestic work in India for the last 15 years or so in mega city regions is that the living model of domestic work has gone. And the new geography of domestic work is that women tend to work in four or five households for about an hour a day where they do a specific set of tasks and they, so their day means that they walk to these five households. So there is a very particular mobility spatiality to their employment pattern, which means they need to live within walking distance of employer households and, and be constrained by them. So they're up in the morning. So if you do time diaries, which we did with them, and then do mobility diaries, which we did with them, they're up in the morning, they send their own kids to school, they go from house to house to house to house for an hour, they come back, pick up their kids from school and go house to house to house for an hour. So this geography and the fact that 100% of our entire sample of workers all walked as their only mode of transportation, right? not even dominant only, meant that they had to live in housing that was in this proximity to elite neighborhoods. So they could not take lower rent houses, for example, within informal settlements. So the forms of housing domestic workers lived in were forms of housing we had not even encountered three floor buildings that are subdivided into single room tenements, you know, uh, not the traditional aesthetics or material forms of informal settlements. They weren't legally informal settlements. We were seeing lodges next to bus stations. We were seeing that real estate developers while building new gated communities and, and, and apartment complexes were keeping a small part of their own land and having a 20 house small settlement on private land that they built where the domestic workers lived with the logic that the, say, that, the, that the livability of those gated communities is linked to the easy proximity and availability of domestic work. So all of these forms of housing were created, but they meant two things. One is that the workers could not go where the rents were cheaper, where the economies that we understand better of the consolidated, dense, informal settlement. It also meant that they had to deal with a new category of landlord that they were not actually negotiating with the state collectively as the auto construction theory tells us. They were each negotiating separately with a private landlord. And that also meant that the way they lived was scattered. It was never large settlements. It was always eight small houses, three houses on rent. So it also meant that there was not a possibility to spatially organize. So in so many ways, this connection that rent for domestic workers is specifically derived from a spatial pattern of the need to walk to elite homes, therefore not allowing an overlap between the geography of informal settlements or slums in Jaipur with the geography of domestic workers. This is the kind of teasing out I'm talking about, right? Is to say, and thinking a little bit about, and I think for each sector and in different ways, this will play out differently. Um, and I think that these are the kinds of ways in which if we start looking at, um, you know, the geography of, and, and you see this with even formal unions in India, actually, one of the most interesting new formal labor organizing that's happened is the new trade union initiative, the NTUI, who has started organizing more in the residential neighborhoods of workers than in their workplaces. So it's an interesting move from the factory to the house. Um, and in some ways, it harks back to Manuel Castell's writing about a new geography of urban mobilization in city in the grassroots, anticipating that the conditions of urban life would become the mobilizing modes of organizing, not just the conditions of work and wage. Um, and that's partly why, even in today's talk, I was trying to bring constantly bring wage and income back with social protection and public institution function, because I think there's many ways to do it. Um, and spatializing them is very key. The second really quick example I'll give is, we are trying to work now with the government to create new maps of, say for example, in Delhi, where did those 3.8 million new applications for temporary food come from in the city? What is the geography of that need? So if you take uh, vulnerability informality, take food security as the proxy, relief gives you this incredible empirical experiment that 3.8 million people called the helpline and said, I need help. Where are they in the city? Are they dispersed? Are they concentrated? Do they live in particular kinds of neighborhoods? Is that vulnerability geographically understandable by current planning categories, by current categories of residents? Do they mostly live in um, interstices? Are they migrants? Are they moving? Are they on rent? 
right? So there's a, so those, you know, there is an incredible kind of revealed vulnerability um, that can allow us these kinds of work. So these are the kinds of, this is the kind of research I'm hoping we'll see a lot more of. Okay, that's a very tantalizing point on which I'm afraid that we, we must end. Thank you uh, so much to uh, Gautam Ban. Um, and the next session in this symposium series will focus on informal settlements, which is on November 11th at uh, 4 p.m. Melbourne time. And you can register for that through the website infer.org, info, infer where you can also find recordings of these sessions that you may have missed or which you might wish to refer others to. Uh, in the meantime, I want to thank Gautam again for sharing uh, these wonderful ideas and to our audience for your interest and for your uh, questions. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Have good days wherever you are and stay safe. Yeah, yeah. And stay safe, everybody. Bye.